you saw Diane earlier in a superb piece of pure silk taffeta. You now see Diane in very ordinary cotton muslin. I'm showing Diane in this muslin for a number of reasons. Again, it's that idea of how, having worked with a piece of fabric, placing it against the mannequin, against the girl's body, I then develop my idea into muslin and do the fitting and take half of that muslin apart and then that muslin becomes my very permanent pattern. Here on Diane, the first thought is to talk to you about holding in deep V necklines that gap, or from that circumstance, any necklines that gap, or how, just generally speaking, you should be holding in in certain areas in beautiful, careful couture fit. Diane, may I ask you to sit? I find, and I'm going to ask you to lean back and relax your shoulders, I find these necklines are very, very beautiful, but when one is standing, it's one story, and when the person wearing them sits, it's a complete another story. That's when things fall apart. I don't know whether the camera is showing you, but certainly we are gapping all over the place with this neckline where I have not worked any ease. What I do is to ask the person I'm fitting to sit, and I take one pin, and I put in that pin horizontally until the fabric stays right up against the body. With that pin in, I take a measurement from the shoulder seam to the center of the V, and I mark that measurement on an ordinary piece of straight grain seam binding. I repeat, it is straight grain rayon seam binding, a good quality, not bias, not cotton, but rayon seam binding. With the pin in, remember, I took the measurement. And then I anchor that measurement, or rather I anchor, I begin to anchor that seam binding, say at the shoulder seam and at the center of the V. And in this particular instance, I was holding in 7 eighths inch of, 7 eighths inch of fabric. So having anchored my seam binding with that measurement at the shoulder seam and the center of the V, and with the thought that I have 7 eighths of an inch excess fabric, now remember, the seam binding goes inside here. I'm anchoring on the wrong side at the shoulder seam and the center of the V. Then I go to the right side, and I first distribute the ease with pins pinning through the seam binding. Now, I repeat, I'm distributing the ease, but I'm distributing it completely evenly. And after I have distributed that ease with pins, I take a short needle because I'm going to ask you to do a tiny, tiny little hand stitch. And remember, you cannot do a beautiful tiny little stitch with a long needle. So with a number 10 cruel embroidery needle and a single strand of size A, as in ABC, size A silk thread, I do the tiniest possible running stitch by hand just beyond the neckline mark and into the seam allowance. And when I finish, I have a real mess, and that is when I'm asking you to think of the iron, a sturdy ironing board, a sleeve board that has a mitt on the end of it, and we're going to be showing you what I mean by that sleeve board and the mitt that's on the end of it. The mitt I think of as having a pocket. The ham is another story. The mitt with the pocket you can easily slip onto the end of a sleeve board and after I have done my tiny little running stitch, I put that neckline over the round of the ham. And first on the wrong side, with a lot of steam, I begin pressing out all of those bubbles because naturally, holding in 7 eighths of an inch, you're going to have a great many bubbles. After I've gotten as much as I can on the wrong side, then I go to the right side and with a damp cotton press cloth, I work with no steam on the right side. That, I feel, is something that you must think about if we want beautiful, beautiful clothes. Now, in this instance, I'm thinking of a self-facing. In other words, all I'm going to do, having done my stitch by hand, having pressed it out so it's completely flat, is to turn this fabric back on itself, a self-facing. That is where I'm asking you, if you're cutting from patterns, to give inch and a half seam allowances if we're to do a beautiful fitting job rather than those five-eighths of an inch. That simply won't be enough if we want to do uh, self-facings and if we want to do corrections, which I want you to correct 
rather than to machine stitch everything at first. I want you to hand baste first, got a friend or a neighbor to help you fit, and then develop it into clothes. Now, Diane, may I have you standing? It's the same story in the back. This dress has all had its back held in. Here on this side, I've left the self facing down, but indeed, that tape is in here. On this side, I turned it back to show you how, if you will press, even in something like this cheap muslin, you wouldn't know it was held in. Here, we are held in. Now, on Diane, I might hold in a little bit more because remember, I fit this dress on one girl's body in New York, and here we have beautiful Diane. I might do a little bit, but basically, I feel it is very good. Another important thing here that I feel strongly about, would you notice these pins? Whenever I have a curve like this, whenever I'm setting in a set-in sleeve, I work from the right side of the garment, not from the wrong side. I don't feel we could ever achieve a beautiful curve here if we were working from the wrong side. So what I do is to, in the fashion fabric, is to trace my markings by hand with a needle and thread onto the right side. And then in this instance, I pin the bodice over the skirt, then we slip baste by hand, and then I turn inside out to use that slip basting as a guide for my machine stitch. This is an example of a long bias seam. Now, when I talk bias seams, I'm not thinking just of true bias. This has is very definitely biased, but it's following the anatomy. Where the anatomy curves in, my bias has curved in, if you would see my pattern on the flat. Where we begin to get into the stomach area, I draw those biases way out so that if there is a bit of tummy, that beautiful bias grain begins to camouflage it. And then on someone like Diane, we get all of these bias folds, which I happen to think have a great look. But remember, please, when you have curves, to work from the outside. When you have long bias seams from the bust line down, preserve the grain until you're at the machine. Once there, stretch for all you're worth. Now, of course, what we have done here is first to have hand basted that bias seam in sections because in stretching at the machine as you're stitching, I want all that to give with you. So what we have done is to start with a knot at the very top baste a few seam, a few stitches, cut my thread, go over a couple of those stitches, stretch again, not stretch, excuse me, I'm wrong, don't stretch, baste again six inches, cut my thread, another six inches, so at the machine, all of those cut threads give with you and yet hold the seam together. What I'd like to do is to bring on Nikki this phenomenally handsome fashion lady who wears clothes with such style and such elegance on Nikki is the dress as it developed into fabric from the muslin. The dress in jersey completely unlined. The only thing I have in this garment is that seam binding in the neckline and here all the way around the back. That fabric has very definitely be, been held in. Notice here how I try to work these skirts for the back area with a bit of ease for gracefulness so that the derriere can be taken care of. But here again, just as on Diane, this fabric has all been held in as I showed you. Yes, indeed, that seam binding is in the dress as well as in the muslin. What I do on the muslin, I do exactly on the dress. People are asking me all the time, when I say I've held in, why didn't I move that fabric up into the shoulder seam? Or why didn't I take my pattern and say do like a dart or some kind of an arrangement across to adjust that pattern? I don't believe in that. There is that bust area. Where there is the swell of the bust, I need that fabric. Otherwise, I'm making you uncomfortable and I'm flattening you. Where the body begins to uh, where there is not that much flesh, that's where I need to hold in that fabric, and that is my reason. Now, why I'm asking you to do this by hand, remember, as I said on the muslin, I'm using a self-facing. This fabric has just been turned back on itself. Yes, of course I might hold it in with a machine stitch, but 
if Nikki gave an energetic movement, she could really break my machine stitch. She will never, ever crack my handwork. If I were doing a very high round neckline, or say a U neckline, where I have to notch into an eighth of an inch, there I would stitch on a facing. And in that instance, I would do the same preliminary work of having you sit, putting in one pin until that fabric stayed right up against the body. Now, because I would be stitching on at a high round neckline, I would put in two rows of long stitching or long machine shirring, pull those up to the measurement that I took when the pin was in, go to the board where I have my good steam iron, my very, very sturdy sleeve board with a mitt on it, press all of that hold out in, and then because I'm stitching on a self-facing, not a, I'm stitching on a facing rather than employing a self-facing, I am reinforcing that machine stitch. So there I can use the machine stitch. What I ask you to do is not to hold in the facing, cut it off at the shoulder seam, or if there's a center front seam, the amount that you have held in so that you equate. So here again, I'd like to remind you, on the dress that you see, we did all of this work from the right side. Pinning first, then slip basting by hand, and then turning inside to do the machine work. Here, as I mentioned to you on the muslin, we preserved the grain until we were at the machine, and of course we hand basted in sections this long bias seam. But once at that machine, we stretched for all we were worth. And yes, it did look a mess when we got finished. Mine always do. I go to the ironing board where I employ three processes. I always press all seams and darts flat first. That takes away a great deal of the machine kink. Then I begin to press them open with steam, having first placed cut up strips of manila envelopes under those seams so as not to get impression on the right side. In other words, I take manila envelopes that have been sent to me through the mail, cut them up so that costs you no money, put them under the allowance, and press first with steam in the opening of the seams. Then the third process, I'm talking about the first process of being pressed together to get out the machine kink, then open with steam with the manila envelopes, and then I go to a third one, leaving the manila strips under there. I take a well-rung cotton press cloth, and I'm underscoring the word cotton, a well-run cotton press cloth, and with no steam, I give that seam on the wrong side another press, and there you have then the kind of seam that you see here. I'd like to bring in, I'd like to excuse Diane and Nikki and bring in another Diane with, again, this neckline thinking. And here on Diane is a pattern a muslin of a pattern, a Vogue pattern, that perhaps some of you recognize. It is the Diane von Furstenberg pattern from Vogue Patterns. I think it is a garment that many of you might have sewn. My experience has been that once seated, again, that neckline too often falls away. So I'm showing you here on Diane the same story of how you could hold in that neckline. I asked her to sit. We pinned in, we put the measurement, as I mentioned, having taken it with that pin in on this ordinary piece of straight grain seam binding on the inside and began to ease with pins. But what I feel is interesting here, this pattern calls for a bust dart. And I don't know about you out there, but I find those bust darts difficult to work with. It seems to me that they're never ending in quite the right place. And also, I feel, as you might agree, I made some different arrangements over here with the seam. Notice the cleanliness here as against all of the guppel here. Now, what I did on that side was to put in what I call a design line. So I simply took pins, and from that dart, I pinned, respecting the anatomy all the time, and I pinned right straight across until I arrived at this neckline, which helped me in the hold-in, of course. And in that way, I feel I do a great job 
of cleaning up on the anatomy. Even with those few pins, you begin to see how much cleaner this looks. I like design lines, and if they help me get a good fit, indeed, I would leave that line in my fashion fabric. Here about the sleeve, that and the neckline, I feel, are two of the crucial places for us to do a fit. On this Vogue pattern from the Diane von Furstenberg design, I worked, I left this side the way the pattern was. And the minute I start raising Diane's arm, I think you can see how she has problems and we start getting all of this bad pull. When I raise this sleeve, where I made adjustments, I think you see how the sleeve stays, the dress rather, stays right there. And I'm sure that you can see how much problem I have here again. My point being that I think when not that I think only, I know that when you're working with set-in sleeves, generally speaking, you should think two ways. Can we get those sleeves higher under the armhole? The jacket I have on is right under my arm. I could play football in it. And on this side, I know that Diane is that much more comfortable. What I do when I'm fitting a set-in sleeve is to get down on my knee, and I'm asking the person I'm fitting to put her hand on my head. I feel she needs at least that much movement, and here you can see we're not doing a thing to the dress. What I have done here is to raise the side seam of the garment, I'd say a good five-eighths of an inch. Now that is not difficult. To raise the side seam of the garment, remember I'm saying garment, not sleeve, five-eighths of an inch. Now, then I start pinning the sleeve underneath, and in this instance, I gave an inch and an eighth more, <clears throat> excuse me, more than the pattern had allowed for. That, again, is why I need my inch and a half seam allowances. In other words, if I went to where the pattern was, I would have this, and I can't even force Diane's arm down. I'd have that kind of an arrangement. So you can see how much more comfort I'm giving her by allowing an inch and an eighth on the sleeve under the armpit. Now, my general rule for set-in sleeves is under the armpit where we have no flesh, is to stretch the grain of the sleeve against the garment. It's not easy to do, but it is the way to arrive at a beautiful sleeve. I stretch the sleeve of the garment, the stre I stretch the grain of the sleeve against the garment. And once I begin to arrive at that armpit, which we all have, men and women, that's where I start packing in the ease. And I work that ease, say, from the armpit in the front over the shoulder to the armpit in the back, and that is when we start getting a set-in sleeve. Now, it is very important that from that armpit front and back, you give me a cross mark on the sleeve, on the garment. In the front, the same story. In the back at that armpit, a cross mark. On the sleeve, on the garment. Because what I must ask you to do is to pull up the sleeve to the measurement on the garment. I have all of this ease in here. I must put in shirring threads, get, go to my ironing board, get all of that pressed out before I set the sleeve into the garment. That is when then you have a beautifully set sleeve. I'm doing seminars around the country and it is always a great source of amusement to me when women come to me with a garment and say, Look at it. I don't like the way that sleeve looks. I've got all kinds of pukles and gathers. What do I do? So I say, well, take the sleeve out. Take the sleeve out? They get very excited having set the sleeve in, but what they did not do was to press out all the ease before they put the sleeve into the garment. Press it out, then we get there with comfort and beauty.